Hey there. Um, I'm going to do Sardis now, uh, continuing the letter of the seven churches. And, you know, Sardis, I've always kind of known what I believe it means, but I just read it fresh today and got into it. And some things stood out to me that were pretty interesting. Um, you know, Sardis, people say, well, this is the only church that God has nothing good to say about, you know. And I can kind of see that. Um, but his attention to them is pretty confirming, actually. And uh, historically, if we're looking at the periods of church history, this is after Thyatira, and this is after the Reformation. And most people who have this kind of view of the churches believe that this really depicts the mainline Protestant denominations that denominated into various names. Um, and I, I can see that. Uh, I think the Reformed is closer. The Calvinists and the Puritans are, and not all of them, but in many cases, closer to this description because they have a zeal. The zeal, this is not just your uh, person who goes to the Methodist church down the street on Christmas and Easter. This is someone who thinks that they are in life, but aren't. Um, and we'll get into that in a second. So let's just read it. Um, and unto the church, angel, the church of Sardis. Right, these things says that he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, and thou have a name that thou livest and are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain and are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard and hold fast and repent. If, therefore, you shall not watch, I will come to thee as a thief, and not you shall not know what hour I come upon thee. You have a few names in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcomes the name, the same, sorry, shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name <clears throat> out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels he that has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches and there's a couple different ways you can look at this uh first of all the name sardis is ironic it means prince of joy and uh the names remember uh summarize the problem in the letter or the dilemma in the letter so, this one is an irony, because as the Prince of Joy, he contrasts himself to these ones that are dead, and uh, this death, I think, is that they don't have the reality of being refreshed in the spirit. They're not refreshed, but I don't know that they're not saved, because he says, Strengthen the things that remain and are ready to die and be watchful. But, uh, honestly, okay, it could be that this church is a mix of unbelievers and believers and that the overcomers are being affected by the condition of the believers, maybe. Um, but, anyway, the name is Chur Church in Sardis is Prince of Joy. He says, these things says he that has the seven spirits of God. Now, the seven spirits of God are the seven uh, eyes of the Lamb in Revelation uh, 5, I believe, that are flames of fire before the throne. And they're the flame of the seven churches. And that's called the sevenfold spirit of God. And not a lot of people go into that, but... I've heard it explained, and I, I like it this way, is that it represents the intensification of the Spirit to produce the shining of the lampstands in this age, which is very dark. 
I mean, the reason the churches are lampstands is because the age is dark and there's no light. And because of that darkness, there's an intensification of the shining. And so it's the sevenfold intensified spirit to shine, to produce stars in this age and lampstands among the overcomers. And that shining has to be so bright because the darkness of the age has crept into the church. The church is covered up in this darkness. So for you to be able to see, the message has to shine so clearly and brightly to have discernment between truth and error and all that. The message, the, the spirit has to burn to produce real believers who are clear about what it is they believe and why and can take a stand uh, in that understanding and not be moved by the winds of doctrine and all the different things requires an intensification of the shining so that it's that much brighter. So, once again, we have a name, Prince of Joy, uh, which Christ is the Prince of Joy. And he is in contrast to this church. And he's also the one with the seven spirits of God. Again, in contrast to the dead condition of the church, the light and the life are with him intensified. And the seven stars, he holds the seven stars in his hands, the messengers of the churches. And once again, though, it speaks to their shining he says, I know that thou works, I know your works, and you have a name that you live and are dead. Now that name there could be reputation. You have a reputation for being very much alive, but you're dead. Now when he's talking about life, he's talking about spiritual life. You have a reputation of being very spiritual, seeming very spiritual or religious. But also the name could be not just their reputation, but they are living out a name. Um, like that was a problem in the church in Corinth was that they were going to divide over. I'm of Cephas. I'm of Paul. I'm of Paulus. Well, I'm of Christ. These are names that they were, they were going to divide into division is death. It paralyzes and nullifies the function of the members in the fellowship, the flow of the fellowship. Um, and then after the Thyatira, after the Protestant Reformation, the Protestant churches divided into so many different denominations, all by following names. So you have a name that you live. I mean, there's some people who are Lutheran, and that's the name. What are you? Are you a Christian? No, I'm a Lutheran. <laughs> are you a Christian? I'm a Methodist. Uh, and they won't fellowship any, with anybody outside their camp, if there's any fellowship at all. So that could be speaking of that as well. But he says they're dead. Now, dead's not good. I mean, dead is dead. Dead means not regenerated. You could say then there these people that he's talking to are not regenerated, except he's speaking to those who have an ear to hear. So, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, and the things are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Now, the thing is, is that the Calvinists especially have this zeal. That's why I think that they, the Reformed tradition, Calvinism and Puritanism, which really uh, overran the Protestant churches, and it's really Roman Catholicism without the names and the baggage of the Catholic Church and the idols. But as far as their view of justification and the perseverance of the saints and backloading works and all that stuff, they are very zealous for spiritual things to the point where they'll burn heretics at the stake, burn witches and all that, the Salem witch trials, you know, there was very, very much like, you know, the Puritans were very prayerful and, and, uh, zealous, but they were overthrowing justification. A lot of them like Spurgeon, for example, was a Puritan who could speak clearly on justification. But sometimes you wonder if he was a Lord chipper. And it's a, it's a mix. The thing is, is it's not always so clear cut. It's one thing if somebody comes out against the gospel persistently 
and employs tactics that are where they're deliberately twisting the word and you can tell they're liars. Those are wolves. But then there's people who are alive but dead. They are they believe that Jesus died for their sins. They believe he rose from the dead and they be, believe it fervently. But they've gone to the laws of rule of life and their zeal is generated out of law keeping, which makes you go, are they saved? And I, it's one thing to be caught up in it. It's another thing to be a ravenous wolf that abuses people with it. And it's a mix. That's why I, I said this one's a mix. It's hard to tell, you know, but the overcomers in this who have a ear to hear, he's addressing them and saying, be watchful and strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. See, it's not so like in Thyatira, there's clearly two groups. There's my servants and they're not doing well because they're being seduced by Jezebel and they're tolerating her. But then there's Jezebel and her children and those who commit adultery and those who know the depths of Satan. Clearly there's the unbelievers and the, and the believers, right? But this is harder because there's not a you and them being addressed. Like Pergamum, you know, if you don't repent, I'll come against them with the sword of my mouth. Who? Those who have the doctrine of Balaam. It's very clear that there's two different groups. But in Sardis, it's indistinguishable. It's really difficult to tell. And the ones he's referring to, he, they, they all fall under the umbrella. And the ones who have an ear to hear, which must, which are regenerated, the overcomers, the believers, he tells them, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. So it's possible to be a believer and just be abiding in death. Where do we see that? Romans 8. The mindset on the flesh is death, and if you walk according to the flesh, you must die. What is walking according to the flesh? In Romans 8, it's referring to the kind of walk that shows up in Romans 7, where you are supposed to be married to Christ, but you think you're still married to the law, and you don't see that you died to it. And you're trying to keep the law as a rule of life. And it hasn't produced a crisis for you that has brought you to a place where you say, Oh, Lord, who should deliver me from the body of this death? It's a deeper realization than justification. You can be justified and still walk in the flesh and be under condemnation, and yet thinking that you're very zealous for God, and yet being in the flesh, and you're abiding in death. You're walking in death. You're walking in the flesh. So when he says, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, he's talking about good things that are right. The things that are ready to die. What's ready to die in this situation? Your view of justification is starting to fade out because you're so it's so eclipsed by your law-keeping life. For I've not found your works perfect before God. See, these people are trying to maintain good works to the point where they've neglected how they got saved. How do I know that? Because remember, therefore, how you've received and heard and hold fast and repent. Repent of what? Sin? No, you've forgotten how you received. You've forgotten how you heard. Remember, this is these are like the same situation as in uh, Galatia, where they were trying to be, they were saved, and they initially had a sense of blessing, and they'd been men, heirs of God, but then these deceivers came and said, no, unless you keep the law, you can't be saved. Or you might be saved, but if you don't keep the law, You'll lose your salvation, or maybe you weren't saved. How do you know? you got to look at the law. And Paul said, no. How did you receive the Spirit? Was it by the hearing of faith or by the works of the law? He says, who bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was presented as crucified among you? Let me ask you this. How did you hear? How did you receive the Spirit? Was it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Having... Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are you now going to be perfected in the flesh? They're walking according to the flesh. They're abiding in death, according to Romans 8. They've moved away from their base. Their base, according to Galatians 3 there, is, look, 
Christ was presented to you crucified and you believed it. And when you did, you received the spirit. But now you've been caught in a way cut off from the benefit of being an heir because Christ has made no effect in you because you're seeking to be justified by the law, even though you are already justified by faith. You're a mixture. And that's what we see with Sardis, I believe. Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die, for I have found that, not found that, works perfect before God. You're boasting in works, you're trying to keep, maintain works, and they're not perfect. And that's the requirement. If you're walking according to the law, that's a requirement. You know, if you're, if you're judging works by law keeping, the requirement is perfection. Jesus is saying, look, I haven't found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you've received and heard. That's the gospel. And hold fast to what? It's the same admonition as in Philadelphia. Again, hold fast to that which you have and let no man steal your crown. Or in um, Thyatira, he says, uh, those of you who don't know the depths of Satan, I'll put on you no other burden. Um, only hold fast to that which I have, which you have until you, till I come. Sorry. Same thing. Hold fast to the gospel, to the truth you know. But you've got to repent of this unbelief. You've got to repent of cleaving to law and abiding in death and walking according to the flesh, even though everybody thinks you're also spiritual. Actually, you're in death. There's no spirit. There's no joy. There's no prince of joy in your heart. You're dead. You have a reputation that you live. You have a name that you live, but you're dead. I will come upon, if you don't watch, he says, I will come upon you as a thief and you'll not know what hour I come. Now that is a reference to his coming and it's possible to be walking in the flesh. And see, walking in the spirit is the key to knowing that he's coming. Not looking at all the signs outside. I know plenty of people who look at all the signs prophetically and yet they are dead inwardly. No, it is an inward renewing. Thou hast a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. Okay, sorry, I keep listening to my son's... Okay, the, they've not defiled their garments and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. Now here, defiling your garments. You think, oh, that's sinning. no. It's a by, it's touching death. That is a Levitical reference, and the first mention of it is that you could, if you touch death while you're in your priestly garment, you're defiled. You could touch a dead person and be defiled. And in many cases, in most, when you look through Leviticus and you look up the word defiled, it'll keep saying um, that if you do this and you don't know it. It's hid from thee. Like if you touch an unclean thing and it's hid from you, when you do know it, you're defiled. <laughs> it's really interesting. And it says it again and again and again. And I, don't, I can't look it up on my phone right now. But I looked up the word defiled and went through the references in Levitical, Leviticus. And it was this idea that hidden things could defile you and you're not aware of it. And the first one is that you touch something dead. Um... It was talking, what it's talking about is you don't know your condition before God. You are not renewed. To be dead is in contrast to being renewed by the spirit of the living God, by the one who has the seven spirits, by the spirit of life. We are had to walk in newness of life versus the oldness of the letter. Now that I think about it, those two are contrary, right? What is the oldness of the letter? The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And in Romans 7, it says we died to the law so that we could serve in newness of letter and not, newness of the Spirit and not oldness of letter. The newness of the Spirit is depending on the living Christ in me to be my righteousness, to be my sanctification, to be my everything, and to wash me from within, to renew me. And when I do that, I have undefiled garments because inwardly I'm not, I'm not dead. And I'm not touching death. You know, a dead person inside who's not being renewed will come to the word and become even more unclean when they read it as a letter. Um, the word has to be spirit to you, but it depends. Are you in the spirit when you come to the word? Are you looking to touch Christ or are you just looking for information? There's plenty of people who study the word and every time they do it, they get, they get dead, even deader because it's the letter that kills. It's just information. 
Like he said, you search the scriptures, but thinking in them you have life, but you won't come to me that you may have life. You have to come to the Lord. He is the source of life. He is the living one. He is the prince of joy. He is the one to renew you from within and to wash you. This is something in a way for all of us. We need to be renewed. Um, to defile your garment is to walk in death, to walk in the flesh, to be walking in priestly service. That's a priestly garment. And yet not be in life, but be in death. Not be leaning heavily on Christ, but instead following the letter. So that's why I really believe it's the, the Sardis is these zealous, uh, law-keeping believers. There's, there are zealous believers who have, for, who have, who by their trying to keep good works and know the Bible, their works and their dead way of touching the word has eclipsed their knowledge of justification to the point where now that even that which they which saved them in the first place is getting ready to die, which it can't. That's the one good thing is that the witness of the Spirit is perpetual. He lives inside of us. That's talking about the regenerated believers in this case. These are, again, I believe he's addressing regenerated believers who have been defiled because they're touching death. And they may or may not know it, but he's bringing it to their attention. Okay? Um, and he says, they'll walk with me in white, for they are worthy, the ones who have not defiled their garments. How, how can you not defile your garments? By... Uh, walking in the spirit, being renewed in the spirit of your mind and coming to Christ and relying on him and not relying on the arm of the flesh for your, for spiritual service. The garment is really, you know, on the one hand, it's his righteousness that covers you. On the other hand, it's a priestly garment, which means you, it's your equipment for service. It's how you had to dress to serve. And it's your, it, your service can either become a reputation, oh, he's really always serving God and doing this and that, and yet have no inward reality, because it's service apart from Christ, because you're insulated by the law, or it can be the serve the service with a heart that's been purged from evil conscience, and you're in the Holy of Holies to serve the living God. He's the living God, and to serve him is to enjoy him as life the Prince of Joy. Um, this is very subjective. This is why there's not a whole lot of commentary on Sardis, because it's so subjective, uh, meaning it's very focused on inward condition. He that overcomes and shall be the shame shall be uh, clothed in white raiment. Now, here's the thing. If you're a believer in this situation, you can either walk with him in white today, or you, you will be clothed with him in white raiment in the days to come in the age to come right and your name will not be blotted out of the book of life uh some people will read this and say well see he says he could blot your name out of the book of life no just because he impl he says that he won't do something doesn't mean that there's a good chance he will he's saying i will not blot out your name out of the book of life you think you're so condemned because you are you have, I've just rebuked you. Your works are not perfect before me. And you've defiled your garments, right? But you're a believer. I know that he that overcomes is the one that believes that Jesus is the son of God. The same person who wrote this letter defined that for us in 1 John. So he that overcomes, who, who, he who believes, whatever his condition, might not be walking in white now, but he will be clothed in white raiment in resurrection and i will not blot out his name of the book of life but i will confess his name before my father and before the angels he that has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches now another interesting thing is how many times is the name name in here the word name right you have a name that you live and are dead and uh there are a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garments and they shall walk with, with me in white, right? He that overcomes shall be clothed in white raiment and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father. What is the name? The name is how God knows you. Everyone is named by God, according to Ephesians, who the father is 
every family in heaven and on earth is named after him, right? He's, and if you look in like Old Testament history, for example, the names were all prophecies of the generations they lived in. They were all prophetic. In the Jewish culture, the people of God, every single one of their names, their name actually meant their life and the season they lived in and the work they accomplished and the, I mean, it was amazing. And not only that, but the names spell sentences and stuff like that. Some of you guys are familiar with all that. If you put all the names and the genealogies together, you can spell out sentences. Um, this is all the design of God. And that's his knowledge of you. When he says there's names that have not defiled their garments, he's saying, look, I know them. When he says, I confess his name, he's saying, I know you. I'll not blot out your name. I know you. And in the letter before, remember in Thyatira, he said, I'm going to give you a white stone with a new name on it, which only you and I know. The name is very important to God. It is the memorial of who you are before God. And if he knows your name, that means you live before him. The dead who reject Christ will never be known again. They're forgotten. But those who live before God, his, he knows them by name. He knows those who are his. And uh, that is a promise from God. So this letter has some comfort in it. Because even though they're dead, they may have defiled their garments. Right? But they will, if they overcome, they will be clothed in white raiment. It's really interesting. Because on the one hand... They're, they've got garments on, but they're not necessarily walking with him in right, white. To walk with him in white means that you are putting on his righteousness, not your own. And those who overcome, who believe, will be clothed in white raiment, one way or another. He'll discipline you. He will bring you out of this situation. If you're genuinely the Lord's, he will bring you out of this situation. That's really what that means. So that's Sardis. There's not much more to say about it other than look how many times he says the name name <laughs> and that to be dead while you have a reputation that you're alive is not the same thing as walking with the Lord in white. And that means that you're being renewed constantly by him and you're putting him on as your righteousness and you're not seeking to be justified by works. That's really what this means. Okay. Talk to you later.